Welcome back to the dispatch from WPRB News. E. Perry Link is the Chancellorial Chair for Innovation in Teaching across disciplines at the University of California, Riverside, and was until recently a professor of East Asian Studies at Princeton University. In 1996, the Chinese government blacklisted Link, barring him from entering the country for the past 12 years, but allowing Link to express some of his reservations about the state of affairs between the United States and China, particularly in the Academy's ability to offer truthful, unveiled criticism of the current Chinese regime. In 2001, Link helped to translate the Tiananmen Papers, government documents that outline the response to the 1989 pro-democracy movement in China. Professor Link, welcome. I'm glad to be here. So let's start by, by traveling back in time a little bit to 1996 when you were blacklisted by the Chinese government. And before I ask you a little bit about some of the, the issues as relates to academic research, etc., maybe you could sort of set the scene for us. What were the events that, that led to uh, your falling out with the Chinese government? Uh, one thing about this blacklist is that they don't tell you why you're on it. <clears throat> And the reason they don't is that that makes you do exactly what you and I are doing now, and that's guess. Uh, and the more you guess, the more you self-center around the broad range of possible activities. This isn't something they invented for me or even for foreign scholars. This is a uh, standard tactic that the Communist Party of China has used on its own people for as long as it's been around. So uh, that's by way of broad background, and the short answer to your question is, I really don't know. It's, I honestly don't know what it was in particular that pushed me onto this list. I can name a number of possibilities, but all of them are difficult to say were the actual thing. The, the most flamboyant thing that I did, I didn't mean to be flamboyant, it was a very innocent act, but it hit the news, was in February of 1989, when uh, the first president, George Bush, invited a number of Chinese dissidents to dinner, along with many, many other people at a huge banquet in Beijing. And I was friends with some of the dissidents, and just in a very informal way, I offered to share a car with them to go to the banquet, and we were blocked. And the dissident, Fang Lijie, the main astrophysicist dissident, was noticed in his absence, and this hit the New York Times front page and all of the evening news shows the next day. It was a big splash, and I was right in the middle of that because I was the English speaker who could explain to the press what had happened. And I'm sure that this irritated the top leadership of China, and there's no doubt that it did. Uh, but the puzzle in saying that that was what put me on the list is that that happened in 89, and in 93, I went to China. In 94, I worked for Princeton in Beijing all summer in, in China. 95, I went. Although in 95, I had a bit of difficult, difficulty getting the visa. In 96 is the first time I was turned around, so it doesn't quite add up. Some people assume that it's because I helped to edit the Tiananmen Papers, which came out in the year 2000. But that, again, doesn't add up because I was on the list before I'd ever even heard of those papers. So it might have been something in between. One of the things it could have been in between is that in 1994, I formally took the post of the chair of the board of the Princeton China Initiative, which was a group of dissidents who had fled after the Beijing massacre and landed at Princeton with the generous help of one of our Tiger alums, John Elliott, and uh, that group eventually formed its own Princeton University support group called Princeton in, uh, I'm sorry, the Princeton China Initiative. And in 94, I took the chair. Now, it could be that somebody in Beijing in the police bureau noticed that, oh my goodness, this scholar has now become so political that he's become the chair of this dissident group. That could be it. Uh, another thing that happened about that time is that President Clinton, who came into office in 92, uh, very strongly supporting uh, human rights in China and tying China's government's human rights performances to 
um, the most favored nation trade status that our government allowed to China at the time. In 94, he suddenly reversed that policy and, as it was said, delinked human rights from trade policy. Uh, and this put pressure off the Chinese government in fairly obvious ways. And some people think that as soon as they felt their hands weren't tied, then they thought, aha, now we can crack down on these dissident scholars with, no, with impunity, with no fear of, of reprisals. So all of those are possible reasons, but the honest answer is that even now in 2008, I don't know the actual reason. So it seems that there are a number of ways this is a catch-22 situation for, for a professor, for a researcher, as it relates to access and the research. In that, in order to do the research, you need access, but in order to get access, you need to engage in a degree of self-censorship. Do you think that's a fair characterization, first off? And secondly, what do you think access really brings? Is it as important as it might seem initially? It certainly is a fair characterization. There is a lot of self-censorship that goes on in the academic world uh, out of fear that one might land on a blacklist. It's actually more severe among younger scholars, all the way down to undergrads at Princeton, who have asked me many, many times, uh, Lin Lao Shi, do I dare to ask this or that question when I go to China? Or do I dare to translate this book by someone who might be viewed as dissident? Or do I dare to write a PhD dissertation on the topic of democracy? I've had all of these kinds of questions asked to me often. And usually what students do is steer away from anything that's remotely dangerous just because they don't want to block their futures in China. For more mature scholars, it's more subtle and it's deeper inside a person's thinking in exactly where and how. For on a sensitive topic, for example, like the Falun Gong or Taiwan democracy or Tibetan independence, some question like that, senior scholars who are very sophisticated will not avoid the topics, but will couch their, their language in ways that they know they won't offend the top uh, people in Beijing. In, for Taiwan independence, for example, the very word independence needs to be avoided, even if you might talk about preserving the status quo and following the will of the majority of the people in Taiwan and other things that imply a more or less direction toward independence. You don't use the radioactive word. That, that kind of subtle self-censorship happens uh, uh, as well. So certainly it matters. Now, how much it matters in the long run depends on one's field. If you are an political scientist, uh, one who especially wants to advise the American government on Chinese, U.S.-Chinese relations or something like that, it matters a lot uh, if you are cut off from China, so you uh, guard yourself more. A literary scholar like me, I mean, I'm interested in history and literature and values and, and so on, and it matters. I, mean, I would do better and would be happier if I could go to China. But it's not all that crucial, and especially at my stage in a career, it's not that crucial. In the world of email and Skype, I mean, I have a Skype camera on my computer, and I can talk with friends, including explicitly dissident friends in Beijing by Skype if I want to, and they speak very frankly. So I don't feel terribly cut off. And there's an interesting sense, and only a person who lands on a blacklist might really appreciate this. You're afraid of landing on a blacklist, so you self-censor. But once you're on it, you're ironically free. <laughs> because the, the usual punishment that can be meted out for crossing red lines has been meted out. So when I'm interviewed now with you, for example, or with others in the press, uh, I feel pretty free about saying exactly what I think the truth is uh, because I'm on the blacklist. That's an ironic point, I think.